start. So let me start by saying thank you to Mr. Stern for the introduction, very kind introduction. Thank you to the Infosys Corp and the Mandela for hosting this lecture. So let me apologize right at the start because, uh, as you may have noticed in the last three seconds, I speak really fast. And I always start every talk by saying that, look, I will slow down. And that memory of slowing down lasts for about typically three minutes, sometimes five. And so I will rely on you to stop me if I go too fast. I will definitely be carried away. So, you know, if I go too fast and if you. If, yeah, I'm going too fast, close down. Uh, you know, wave a hand, throw a chalk, attract my attention, and I'll slow down again for another five minutes. And then you can stop me again. You proceed from there. Uh, I'm, going to tell, uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, a picture, a physical picture, if you like, but also more an intellectual picture about early galaxies. And, uh, and by early, I mean galaxies as they were about 9 10 billion years ago. And we started to make progress and understand this, and the tool that we've been using to make this progress is one that I love a lot, and that's the giant media they made a scope over here, where a bunch of folk have, you know, in the audience have seen it from the hill overlooking. The telescope. So that's the GMRT. I'll tell you more about it shortly. And the person over here is Gobind Swaroop. Uh, Gobind was the person who led the team that designed and built the GMRT. And sadly, he's not with us uh, today. But, uh, but without Gobind's work, it's not possible. So I think he really needs the accomplishment. Uh, and the other person on the, on the image is Aditya Chaudhary, uh, who is a PhD student who worked with me on this, uh, on, on, a, on a lot of stuff, but certainly all, you know, on this stuff. And uh, who I think did, you know, by far the bulk of the work, uh, certainly much more than I did. And uh, and with whom it's been a great pleasure to work. So, you know, uh, and uh, he, he also has kindly made a few of the images, but quite a few of the images uh, for this talk. Okay, so when you talk about portraits of you know things, you always have to talk about the medium of the portrait, you know, what colors, oils, you know, what what's the medium. And so this is a gas portrait uh, of these early galaxies. And uh, I don't really have a good analogy for uh, you know acrylic or fabric or canvas or whatever, but you see gas, gas in the sky. And I'm going to follow this philosophy. This is the thing that Max Delbruck said to Alfred Hershey about 80 years ago, when Hershey asked him, you know, what level should I get this clock at? And he said the speaker should assume absolute ignorance and infinite intelligence on clock talking. So I will apologize right at the outset if I'm uh, uh, if you know most of the stuff that I will be telling you about. So, one. Okay, so what's a galaxy? So a galaxy is basically, most people think of galaxy as a collection of stars. And that's kind of, you know, true, it's partly true. So that's a wonderful galaxy, NGC 6546, in an image actually made with a small, very crappy telescope uh, on the ground. These are digital sky survey plates made with, you know, smallish telescope, two meters in size. And you still see these beautiful spiral arms going out. So this is like the Milky Way, it's an object similar to the Milky Way. It's called the Fireworks Galaxy. So it's a cute galaxy. One reason it's cute is that in the last uh, 100 years, this galaxy has had about 10 supernovae. 10 stars have actually gone boom inside the galaxy, exploded, and have brightened to almost uh, as to be as bright as the galaxy itself. So it's for some reason, it forms stars, it forms big stars, much more efficiently than other galaxies. And that's made it kind of a poster child, so to speak, uh, for astronomers. So galaxies are collections of stars. How many stars? You know, is a small cluster of stars inside a galaxy also a galaxy? Of course not. A galaxy is a gravitationally bound collection of stars. And to give you a, you know, a feeling for the numbers we're talking about over here, in a galaxy like the Milky Way, biggish galaxy, we're talking about about 100 billion stars. That's a largest number. These are reasonably desert objects. But stars are not everything that make up a galaxy. The second, in fact, you might say the first part of galaxy is gas. And in fact, the reason I would say that, that you know gas is the first part of a galaxy, more than stars, is that stars actually form from gas. If you didn't have gas, you wouldn't form stars. So basically, a galaxy contains lots and lots of hydrogen gas. The bulk of the baryons, the bulk of the matter as we know it in the universe, is hydrogen, 75% by mass. And that's true of galaxies as well. Galaxies contain a ton of gas in them. And this gas, mostly hydrogen, essentially it cools. It's at a temperature of about 10,000 degrees Celsius, let's say. And it cools. And as it cools, it gets denser. So it gets compressed. 
And as time goes by, it gets colder and colder and colder. And at some point, the, at the atoms, the atomic hydrogen, the atoms come together uh, in a somewhat more technical way than I'm saying it. They come together and they form molecules. And at that stage, the molecules can really cool fast. And the molecular clouds can now come together, the molecules in the cloud, and they can self gravitate which means that the cloud will not collapse under its own gravity, under its own weight, and that's when you form a star. So, atomic hydrogen is the primary fuel for star formation in a galaxy. So, if you want to know for the stars, you must know for the gas. The second thing you see over here, so this is the lovely image of NGC 6546 by Dennis Kuzma in his PhD about 15 years ago, and this is from the Mr. Bob telescope. You also observing that lens of this. But the first thing that you see is that these are on the same scale. The gas is much, 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 it goes out much, much, much further than the stars. The stars are in the center of the galaxy, and the gas goes way beyond. And in this galaxy, the gas goes out maybe about a factor of two or three more than the, than the stars. There are small galaxies, this is a big galaxy like the Milky Way. There are small galaxies where the gas goes out a factor of 10 bigger than the stars. The stars are kind of here, and the gas is kind of here. So it's a huge, the gas is basically the fuel, and the gas flows into the center of the galaxy, cools down, forms molecules, forms stars. And then the stars go boom. So, how does the galaxy form to begin with? Right? It's, well, we've talked about the contents. And I should have you know, I said in passing over here, the galaxies also contain dark matter, but dark matter does not play a role in this talk, so I won't put a list somebody asks. Dark matter dominates the mass of the galaxy by about 80%. And there's a tiny amount of dust in galaxies. Dust is really tiny. It's, it's about one hundred of the mass of the hydrogen, but it's really important. So it's, it's important way out of its uh, way, way beyond its mass because the dust is where the, the molecular hydrogen forms. We we'll leave that one side. The bulk of the matter is in stars, gas, and dark matter. And I won't talk about dark matter. I'm going to talk about stars and gas in this talk. So how do galaxies form from the point of view of the universe? So to understand this, you can look at a simulation of, this is a huge region of the sky, and the simulation is going forward in time. And I'll play it a couple of times. The universe started off as being fairly reasonably continuous, and, and let's go back again, go forward again. And you can see this, this thing is kind of smooth, very, very smooth. And the red regions are regions of higher density, the blue regions are regions of lower density. And what's happening as time evolves is that matter flows from these blue regions into the red regions. And you can see it actually flows along these filaments. And galaxies form at the nodes of these filaments. So this is how, on a big scale, this is how uh, uh, galaxies form. And you can see that there are groups of galaxies together over here. The size of this region, although it looks tiny, this is the size of a gigantic super galaxy. It's a cluster of actually. It contains typically a thousand to ten thousand galaxies. So this is kind of telling you that this scale, the size we're talking about here, is gigantic. So a point over here is a galaxy. Right? So you should think of this region as a galaxy. This is a huge collection of galaxies, and these collections, these clusters, form an intersection of all these filaments. Matter flows along the filaments. And then you have these large regions over here, which have very few galaxies, and these are called cosmic points. They're basically regions which are empty of, of galaxies. Why does this happen? This happens for a very simple reason. It happens because of gravity. Gravity is attractive. Right? So when you chuck a ball up, it falls back down. Now, when you started off with this universe, which was nice and smooth, right? It wasn't perfectly smooth. There were small regions in the universe which had a little more matter. And there are regions which had a little less matter. The regions which had a little more matter and slightly higher gravity. And therefore, the regions around them felt a slightly stronger gravitational attraction towards those regions. And hence, matter flowed towards those regions. The regions which had a slightly lower level of matter had a slightly lower gravitational attraction because which matter flowed away from those regions. And that's it. That's all there is to this. It's just gravitational attraction. Matter moves towards regions of high gravity. Once the matter moves there, you produce more matter because we get more gravity, more matter comes in, and so on and so forth. And you can form a big galaxy like this one, like a super galaxy over here. And that's a large scale picture. And 
the only physics which has gone into this is gravity. In fact, technically, this is a dark matter simulation. No baryon, no stars, no gas, nothing has gone into it except for dark matter. So these things are where galaxies will form uh, or have formed, if you like, and they will then contain baryons inside them, which will be a small fraction of their mass. So what happens if you now zoom in and look at the galaxy itself? I just said that you know, a galaxy on this scale is like a point over here. But you want to see what's happening you know, around the galaxy. So let's look at this picture. So this is a picture now which is about a scale which is 1000 and smaller than the previous image. Again, it's a movie, but now this is gas. So over here, you see the gas flowing in into the galaxy. The galaxy is a small region in the center and it's growing with time. And this tiny little thing over here is the zoom in on the central region, which is stars. And what you see is that, again, time is going forward. This is about 11 billion years ago. And you kind of see that it's a mess. There's gas flowing in. It's kind of whacking into the central region. It's kind of hitting each other, th things over there. The hitting is causing shocks to form. The shocks cause stars to form. The stars go supernovae, they blow gas out, so gas actually moves outwards as well. So there's lots of complex physics over here. You know, it's whoosh, 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 whoosh again, and then balances between the inflow and outflow. We call it outflow if you like. So lots of, you know, bad stuff is happening, and it's going very slowly through this. This is now for 9 billion years ago, and you see that over here, now you start to see a disk forming. You even see some spiral arms over here, right? And you see lots of gas coming in over here, which are like, like this one over here. This is actually a small galaxy, which is falling into this big galaxy because this one has a higher, uh, it has more gravity. And it actually even disturbs this one. You'll see another, another big one coming very shortly. And what you also see is that suddenly now, here's a big galaxy shooting in, and it will merge with this one you know, in a little while. But the thing that you see immediately over here is that, ouch, you won't see it, unfortunately. Kind of stopped, is that in the beginning all of this was pink. So yellow is where there's the most gas, pink is where there's less gas, and blue is where there's the least gas. And what's happening essentially is that this galaxy is cleaning up its the certain galactic medium, the region around it, is cleaning it up of the gas. The gas is flowing from the certain galactic medium, from the intergalactic medium, into the certain galactic medium, and onto the galaxy. And then Turning into stars. So the galaxy should not be thought of as just an object. It's actually interacting with its neighbors, it's drawing the matter from the intergalactic medium, and it's actually chucking stuff out again and polluting the intergalactic medium with metals, with dust, all kinds of stuff. Some of which may actually cause. So here's this big nice galaxy coming in over here, it's coming back to the sky in a second. So you can see that it actually distorted this galaxy, the interaction. Which, which is basically called a merger, it caused the galaxy to spill over. And that, that's what actually happens. Of course, you know, this is very pretty. And it's nice, you know, and, you know, it's nice to watch this. And you can see that it's, you know, a lot of the physics seems to make sense. It is clearing out the gas around it. You can see most of the stuff is now blue over here, and most of the pink stuff is in the center as time has gone by. And there's very little stuff outside. The, the gas has predominantly flowed inwards. So what's the bad news? Well, it's just beautiful, right? We have the answers to everything. Why bother you know, spending time doing stuff? The bad news is that it's a simulation. It's not the universe. And the catch is that the information that we have put into the simulation has been obtained by observations. The physics that is going on in the simulation is way too complicated to actually run it from first principles. You simply can't do it. You can't form stars, for example. This is a, uh, to actually form a star on a computer and form 100 billion stars is essentially impossible to do. And causing the stars to interact with the gas, drive gas out, drive gas in, not possible. So what you do is that you actually use observations to tell you what you should expect. And then you calibrate your simulations compared to the observations. So the simulation actually look very nice, of course, but they're not really teaching you anything as of now. They might teach you in the future, but as of now, we're still at the point where we desperately need observations to constrain or to tell us what the universe is like. 
And that's what we've been trying to do over the last two decades or so. So as I said, it's a simulation. And simulation, you know, is used in the positive sense in astronomy if you're actually doing something. It's also used in the Oxford Dictionary to mean fake. So, you know, caveat emptor if you like. So I'm going to shift now completely into actual the real universe. So how do we now go and observe galaxies? So this is now a cartoon of a galaxy from the aspects the page of Heidelberg. This shows the disk of a, of a spiral galaxy with the stars and molecular gas are. Then there's this big region around over here, which is the atomic gas. Then there's a certain galactic medium from which gas flows onto the disk of the galaxy. And then way beyond that, there's an the intergalactic medium. There's not the scale. In reality, this region will be about a factor of much more than 10 smaller than the size of certain galactic medium. But the stars are in this region 1. The molecular gas kind of goes out to region 2. The atomic gas goes out much further, at least to region 3 and probably beyond. And the certain galactic medium goes out even further. So how do you actually go and observe these different constituents of the galaxy? The way you do it is based on the fact that light that we see is electromagnetic radiation. It is specified by its wavelength. And the light that we know and love is just one branch of electromagnetic radiation. It's the optical branch. Our eyes are sensitive to the optical, partly because the sun probably, because of evolution and because the sun the radiation peaks in the, in the optical, but the only thing that differentiates the optical from, for example, the X-rays or the millimeter or the radio is simply the wavelength of the light. So light consists of, of oscillating fields with the thing that goes up and down. In the optical, the oscillation is fast, very fast as you can see over here. In the X-ray, it's much faster. In the ultraviolet, it's slower than the X-ray, but faster than the optical. In the infrared, which is here, it's slower than the optical. In the millimeter, which is here, it's even slower. In fact, the reason that these are called millimeter is that the wavelength of light is one millimeter. And finally, in the radio, which will be the focus of this talk, the wavelengths are much longer. So, for example, the, the telescope we're talking about is observing with wavelengths between about 20 centimeters, which is, you know, about whatever, this big up to about 2 meters, which is like a slightly like longer than me, so which means that the wave is going, you know, all the way down to me. So the wavelength is huge, it's a very slow, long wave, right? The only difference between all of these is the oscillation of the wave, right? But why does all this matter? This matter is actually because the techniques that we use at the different wavelengths are different. And the emission that you see or the way in which you probe the different kinds of matter are different. They have their signatures at different wavelengths. So, for example, the stars, the reason we can look up and see stars is that they look at the optical and the ultraviolet. You see stars really bright in the optical. So, therefore, if you want to observe a galaxy in, in, in starlight, you observe the optical or the infrared. That's a good place to observe it in. The molecular gas, it turns out, emits mainly in the millimeter. Carbon monoxide is a huge source of emission in the millimeter. And it turns out that the main lines, the main emission of molecular gas is in a millimeter. And the atomic gas, which as I said is this big region, and that you know, the picture that you see four six that you saw, is actually at 21 centimeters at a very specific wavelength. So if you want to observe the atomic gas, you have to observe it at precisely 21.11 centimeters. That's the wavelength at which the gas radiates, right? And we can talk about why it radiates there later if you like. But for now, just take it on board. 21 centimeter is the way in which you probe atomic gas. That's the, that's the signal that we'll be talking about. So moving on. So what changed? So you know, for about you know, 80 years, we've known the galaxy exists. Somewhere about the 1920s, people realized that the what we call the island nebulae. Until the 1920s, we didn't know that these objects were not part of the Milky Way. People were arguing as whether well, the Andromeda galaxy was part of the Milky Way or was beyond. The problem was how do you measure the distance to a galaxy? That was a big issue. That was a famous, there was something called the Great Debate in 1928, in which there was an argument among professional astronomers as to whether Andromeda, which today we know is a huge galaxy, is as big as the Milky Way, right? It's our sister galaxy, and it's our neighbor, and it's gigantic. But there was actually a debate about less than 100 years ago as to whether Andromeda was actually part of the Milky Way or a different galaxy. 
Fortunately, they could put their be on. That was good for yeah. them. They had So what about eighty years? We've been kind of looking at galaxies and trying to find objects further and further away. So why do we want to find objects further and further away? The reason we want to do this is that the speed of light, how do we observe a galaxy? We observe a galaxy by looking at it in light. We observe the light coming from the galaxy. Right? The problem is that the speed of light is finite. It's 29979.458 kilometers per second. I know this number by heart because I made a mistake once about 10 years ago when I was a student, which caused some trauma in observations. So now, I've, you know, as a penance, I remember it to a decimal place. I used to think of the other concept, but it's not. 29979 so, uh, but the more important point is that, whatever the value may be, the speed of light is finite. It's not infinite. What this means is that light takes a finite amount of time to get from point A to point B. So, for example, just to give you a feeling for this, the sun is 8 light minutes away from us. Which means that, suppose the sun were to undergo a gigantic shattering explosion right now. We will know about it for another eight minutes. So there's always a delay between the time when an event occurs, the time when something happens at some place, and when you learn about it. And that delay is just the amount of time it takes the light to get from so the signal if you like, the mystic level of light, to get from that place to you. Yeah? So in fact, the whole point of what we're talking about is that you can, by looking at galaxies further and further and further away, you are looking further and further and further back into the past. You're actually tracing the evolution of the universe by looking at more and more distant galaxies. Because a galaxy which is, you know, say, let's say some distance away, you look at it as it was at that point of time in the past, the galaxy which is further away is, you're looking at it as it was in the previous past, and so on. So the game in all of this is to try to find the earliest galaxies. And as many of them as possible. Because then, you can basically, it's like, if I can find a bunch of galaxies at different locations in the history of the universe, I now have snapshots of how the universe was at those times. Now I can basically just compare the properties of those galaxies, the average properties, at 10 million years ago, 9 million years ago, 8 million years ago, and I can tell you how the universe evolved. How the average galaxy evolved. So that's the game basically over here. You want to find galaxies as early as possible in the universe, as soon after Big Bang as possible, and then as many as possible along the way. And then we can try galaxy evolution. And so lots of people were trying until about the 90s, early 90s, and then there was a revolution. So until then, we kind of, you know, when I started my PhD in 1995, we had a handful of galaxies that were, let's say, that we knew which were about 10 billion years from 10 billion years ago. And then things changed. And the reason things changed, as is very common in astronomy, is due to technology. Astronomy is one science where we are always struggling with uh, sensitivity. We're trying to push, I mean, almost literally, uh, to the frontiers of the universe. And to do that, we are always limited by how sensitive you are. If I build a more sensitive telescope, I can go, I can, I can push further. I can look at a fainter galaxy at the same distance. So that's the game again over here. The fainter the galaxies that I can find, the more galaxies that are out of And what changed in the 90s was first the Hubble Space Telescope went up, and that's been an absolutely wonderful telescope for the last three decades now. And then the Keck telescopes and the very large telescopes were built in the early 90s again, just after the HST, and the VLDs in the late 90s. So the VLDs are in Chile, on Cerro Paraná, and the Keck telescope, these are just absolutely gorgeous locations. They are you know, high upper mountains. You really feel like doing astronomy when you go there. So the, the Keck telescopes are on Mauna Kea in Chile, about four and a half thousand meters above sea level. And when you go up there, you have this amazing view of the Pacific Ocean. You're all around. Mauna Kea is in Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. And so, but the, the real thing, the real things are in Chile. So the real things are in Cerro Paranal in Chile, and the, the Keck telescopes are in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So these are the two best sites in the world for tropical astronomy today. Actually, a little bit of for the uh, millimeter data astronomy today. So, that's what really made a difference. And another thing that made a difference was strategy. 
So it wasn't just technology. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm using the shape that, you know, astronomers, all the astronomers did was to wait until the telescope was there. I mean, more right? But there were a bunch of small astronomers at that point, and they came up with the idea that they gave up the interesting way of finding galaxies, the high directions. And that, in combination with these telescopes, completely changed the view of the world. That happened during my PhD. Uh, not, not by us, but by people in the state, Chuck Stadia and the company. And they suddenly started finding thousands of galaxies at high depth, at large distances. And the way they did it was by looking, by doing what they call called deep fields. So they went to observe these regions of the sky, which were basically empty regions, just picked to be empty. And they just hammered away at them. They observed those regions for as long as they could. So this is one of the deepest images ever made. It's called the Hubble Alpha Deep Field. And so these are Hubble Space Telescope images, and you know, we are kind of used to Hubble Space Telescope images like the one we just saw at the start of the talk, in these beautiful objects that are in the Milky Way. But to get an image like this, where you see a galaxy in spiral arms about 5 million years ago, that requires the HST. HST is absolutely a wonderful telescope, but for this kind of stuff, it's spectacular. And JWST is even better than HST, and it's saying something. So, what do you, how do you do this, right? So, you have a bunch of, this is an image. On the sky. How do I know that this galaxy is 5 billion years you know, from now, if the light is coming 5 billion years ago, and this one is 10, and this one is 11 over there? Obviously, this image doesn't tell you that. This image is just an image. You need something else. So, there's two things, there's two ways you can go about getting this distance information. The first way is by making multiple images of this region of sky in, at different wavelengths. Within the optical, I can make images at, for example, blue, green, yellow, red, infrared. And now I can simply say that, okay, what is a typical galaxy? What should a typical galaxy look like? And it turns out, and again, we show this mathematically, that if a galaxy is far away, the shape the, or the relative intensity, the amount of light that you see, in the different bands is different from a situation that's right next to us. So just by measuring the shape of the optical spectrum, as it's called, you can actually identify how far away the galaxy is. The other way of doing it is more complicated. That's called spectroscopy. Where you actually go and you, you know, if you, if you, take, if you take light and you shine it through a prism, right? If you take light and shine it through a prism, you see white light breaking up into the seven colors or into the rainbow, if you like. That is basically spectroscopy. So you've broken up the light into its constituent parts, and now I can cause that light from the prism to fall onto a, onto a CCD or a CMOS sensor or something like a camera, and I can give you the power at each wavelength, at red, blue, green, and so on. That's a spectrum. It's just the power as a function of wavelength. That's what you can do also for galaxies, and that will directly tell you how far away they are. Very simple. We can talk about that again later. But that's what you need uh, to do to get the distances. Now, once you have the distances, oh my gosh, this is yeah, the, the lights are probably getting it. So now you can actually take those galaxies when you started out with them all over here. Now you can actually feed them back and place them at different distances to us. Where this is what 13 billion years, gosh, you really can't see that, right? This 13 billion years, time is going this way, and we are here today at the end of this long tube, if you like. Oh, thank you very much, but it's still there. I'm sorry, I, I really keep this thing out. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So, I, so as you can see over here, there are a few galaxies nearby, not too many. This is a very small region of the sky. Right? There are not too many galaxies nearby. There are a bunch over here. There are more over here. There are slightly fewer over here, and then very few far away. And you've gotten this via our spectroscopy or by multiband imaging. So again, now, how do you, what do you do with this? So, what you do is this. I can take pictures now of galaxies at different points. So, this is a galaxy very close to us today. This looks like a nice spiral galaxy. I can look at the next one, and you can kind of visually see it looks like a disk, but it doesn't look like as nice a disk as this one. You can look at this one, and this looks, yeah, well, you can imagine this one evolving into this one. Look at this one. This one looks completely mad. And this one is, I, I'm not sure what to call it, a scrambled egg, I'm not sure. And this is, you, if you look at this, you wouldn't call it a galaxy. This is just the central core of the galaxy. Just the central region has actually formed stars. 
And let me emphasize this. All of this is starlight. You are observing it in the optical. This object is the most distant object that we know in the Hubble Earth Radio field. The light from here is coming from about 13 billion years ago. This is about 12, 11 and a bit. This is about 10 and so on. This is about uh, 0.8, 0.9 and this is about 0.5. So by about point, uh, 0.5 billion years ago, 1 billion years ago, you had nice disks in place. And then you probably had them even earlier, even back, for example, 4 5 billion years ago. But very early on, and remember the Big Bang is about 20.8 billion years ago. So this is about 800,000 years after the Big Bang. Galaxies almost didn't exist. They're just small, tiny little thing. You know, it's the center of the galaxies, of the, of the final object that they would become. So this is like an invisibly fact. I mean, this is not the same galaxy. Remember that. These are different galaxies. But you can think of a galaxy, an average galaxy, evolving from something like this to something like this. With time. And the question is, how do they evolve? So let's take a look as they look backwards in time to the Hubble Earth Radio Field. So this is really close by. These are actually stars, which are like stars at zero. And now you start to see, so each of these objects is now coming from this time. The light is coming from these times. And you can see that about three billion years ago, there's a bunch of galaxies already showing up. There are not too many in the recent past because this region is really small. There's not too many nearby objects. You have to go far enough away before you start seeing stars. But six billion years ago, I can actually see spirals over here, six billion years ago. And this is the reddish galaxy over here. And so now, you can see that if you go to eight billion years, there's still galaxies popping up all over the place. So we actually know the, the times from which light is coming from every one of the objects over here. And by doing this, and it's about 5,000 galaxies in this image. By doing this, and this is just one of the fields, because it's the, it's, the, it's the best image that we have it's the best region size image that we have. There is something called the extreme uh, deep field, the smaller region inside of here, which has fewer galaxies, but uh, is even more sensitive than this one. But here are the final galaxies over here, going all the way back to 13 billion years ago, right? not very long after they die, which kind of still blows me away, to be honest. Okay, so what have we learned? And I've tried to kind of condense a large number of things that we learned into one slide. So that idea. But this, if I if I want you to take away one thing about that, actually, if I want you to take away one thing about the universe, I would say that the fact that the universe is expanding is one thing you should take away. The universe is expanding. There was a big bang uh, a long time ago, 13 and a half billion years ago. But in terms of galaxy evolution, this plot kind of summarizes a big picture view of galaxies. So this plot is plot is showing the star formation activity in galaxies in the universe. Averaged over you know, a range of large number of galaxies against the time from which the light is coming to us. So this vertical blue line, the dashed blue line, is the Big Bang approximately. And the earliest galaxies are about 12.8, 13 billion years ago. And what you see is that so time is running this way, right? So we are at, at uh, look back at zero, time is running this way. And so the star formation activity was very low in the beginning. 13 billion years ago, there, there were very few stars forming. And then it kind of rose. Yeah? And it rose until about 11, 11 and a half billion years ago. And then there's this really funny plateau that you see over here, which is often called the epoch of cosmic noon. That's the epoch at which star formation activity in the universe basically was flat. It didn't change very much. So an individual galaxy might produce more stars or less stars. But in an average over galaxies, if I take a large number of galaxies and just say, okay, how many stars can be produced by all these galaxies? It turns out that over this very long period of two billion years, things were fairly quiet. The universe was at the peak of its star formation activity, and they just stayed over there. Why this happened, we do not know as yet. So that's one of the big open questions in galaxy formation. And then you see something else which is weird. You see that. From about 8 billion years or so ago to today, the star formation activity dropped like a rock. So it dropped from about 1.6 in these units to about 0.1 something in these units. It dropped by more than a factor of 10. So over the last 8 billion years ago, the universe has basically stopped forming stars. It's forming stars in a much slower, milder way today than it did about 8 billion years ago. And this has been for the last 20 
20 years. So we have kind of variations of this clock since about 1997. It's often called the Madao clock. You know, Madao came up with it in the paper in 1997. The data, of course, are much better now. But this broad picture, up to about here, was, has been known for 25 years. And the big question in the field has been, why do galaxies stop forming stars somewhere about 8 billion years ago? What happens? So why did the star formation activity slow down? And obviously, I told you the star, stars form from gas. See, if you want to understand star formation, it's not enough to just look at the stars. You have to look at the fuel. You have to look at what's happening with the gas in these galaxies. And that has been hard. And that's been hard for the funny reason. It's been hard because, as I said, the 21 centimeter signal, the signal that we use to detect the atomic gas, that signal is super weak. It's much, 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 much weaker than the optical signals. And we can talk about why it's weaker. It's weaker for the for, for mechanical reasons. But the fact remains, it's about a billion times weaker than optical signals. More than a billion times, actually. So this is a problem. How do you detect a really weak signal? You can detect the optical signals because they're right. But the 21 centimeter signal is weak. So what do you do? You're, you're in trouble. Because the only way of measuring the atomic gas mass of the galaxy, which actually, just as a side story, this was actually the idea uh, what came from a famous uh, Dutch astronomer, Jan Oort, in 1942. He suggested to a student, and this is in the middle of World War II, the Nazis are occupying Holland, and Oort is actually doing astronomy in the middle of World War II. He says astronomy probably has some good things about it. And during the, the he gave this project to a student to try to come up with what is called a radio spectral line. And the reason he wanted this radio spectral line is that he wanted to, to, he wanted to map the galaxy, just the Milky Way. He was thinking about trying to measure the rotation of the Milky Way. And he had been doing this for 20 years, since the 20s, with optical spectral lines. And the problem with the optical is that dust in the galaxy was blocking the optical light from different places. And dust does not affect radio. So therefore he said, if somebody will give me a radio spectral line, you know, I can do this thing. He, he really wanted to map the Milky Way. And radio astronomy had just been born about 10 years before, completely by accident, with a bunch of radio engineers, one radio engineer, and then one more. And uh, so he gave this problem to his, to a, to a PhD student. And during the war in 1944, there was a colloquium in Leiden, in which Henry van der Hoost came up with this uh, train and signal. And then after the war, 1951, it was first detected uh, by Ward and Bullard and by uh, Ed Purcell and, uh, and Doc Even. And then in 1954, uh, the first emission of this, the first signal, was identified from a galaxy, the Magellanic Clouds. So it's about 70 years old, but it's still hard to detect the signal from distant galaxies. You can do it really well for nearby galaxies. And it turns out that when the GMRT was being planned in the early 80s, the reason it was being planned was actually to look for this 21 centimeter signal from really distant galaxies. Because at that time, the two favored cosmos, the models, there were two favored models, which were called the dark matter models. One of them predicted there would be these gigantic supermassive galaxies very early on. And the other one predicted there would be small galaxies. And the 21 centimeter signal could distinguish between the two. So Golden and his team basically said, okay, we need to build a big telescope which can distinguish. It turned out, unfortunately, before the telescope was built, the supermassive galaxy model was already ruled out by the cosmic background explorer. But fortunately, the telescope was built to do all kinds of stuff, and so they've been doing stuff since 1999 when the telescope was uh, released. So, this is a picture from uh, Arvind Shakti, Suresh, and Infosys team, you know, flying drones which just blew me away uh, about uh, two months ago. And that shows a bunch of the GMOT antennas. So these are dishes, there's about eight or nine over here, and as you can see some far away, these are close by, three them are, so these things are about 45 meters in diameter. There's actually a person over here, uh, you can't see, but from the dot in this image. These are big, big, big dishes, and there's 30 of them. And the reason that the telescope is so sensitive is that one, the dishes are big, and two, there's lots of them, there's 30. And so we use this to try to look for radio signals, and we do all kinds of stuff uh, 
with the with the telescope. This is about painting a multi from Puna. So how do you get around this problem of the weak 21 centimeter signal? That's the issue that we are stuck with, right? We want to look for galaxies at say 10 million years ago, but you can't do it. The way to do it is that you take recurves to, st to statistics, which of course should, at this point you should all fall asleep. Statistics are the, the if you mention the word statistics to an audience, they will fall asleep. The, if I just speak about policy. But actually it's fun. And the reason, you know, you should kind of ignore the fact that these are statistics. All you're doing is that you're measuring not the signal of one galaxy. What you're trying to do is to measure the average signals of a lot of galaxies. And the idea is that if I take one galaxy, the signal is buried in the noise. So you see, let's say I make an image of the sky, and that signal is just too faint to be seen. But now I have you know, this image of the sky for this galaxy. I have a second galaxy over here and a third galaxy where the signals are there in this one and this one. Now, what if I just add this, the, the signals together? What will happen is that at the location of these galaxies, the signals can all add up because they all have the signal. It's very faint, but they have it. At the regions where there is no signal, it will be either positive or negative. It's noise basically. And that will average out. So, what will happen? That's what you're seeing over here. You basically have a large number of galaxies, which are the red circles in this image. And you, you basically just take small pieces around the image, around each galaxy, and put them on top of each other, aligning them spatially such that the galaxies are exactly aligned. And then you just average them. So these are our nine galaxies average. You go to the next image, again a bunch of galaxies, again take small pieces, the galaxy is in the center, you again align them. And you can't really see a signal over here. So red over here would be a, would be a signal, blue is fake stuff, yellow is in the noise basically. So blue and yellow are not real things. If you see something that's red over here, you jump up and down. And there's nothing over here so far. But now I'm just going to you know, shoot through this image. So as you keep averaging these you know, regions together, you start seeing in the central region, it gets redder and redder. All that's happening is that you're adding the signal from all these galaxies, and that signal simply is always positive, it just keeps averaging up. And the regions around it, over here for example, there's, there's galaxies over here, like say the regions over here, where this is negative or where this is positive. They just average up. And so, you know, by continuously increasing the number of galaxies, you start to see that the signal keeps building up. And it'll just keep shooting through to this for 400 objects. And you see it gets redder and redder and redder, which means that by averaging 400 objects, which initially had no signal, I suddenly now see a signal. That's it. That's what, what statistics does for you, if you like. Is it happening? And that's the game, basically. All you need is for somebody, maybe you, to go out and find a bunch of galaxies which you can observe simultaneously. So that they are inside the field of view of your telescope. Your telescope looks up there, and there should be a bunch of galaxies inside this field of view. And that's it. And then you simply take their signals, add them up. And then if you're lucky, and if you do you know the answers carefully, you might see that. The other approach, which if you like is a cheap approach intellectually, but expensive approach financially, is you build a much bigger telescope. And that's of course not a bad approach on here also, and then you want to do it at the end of the talk uh, to go forward on this. So this is called stacking. The idea came up about 20 years ago, and we've been trying this for the last two decades, completely unsuccessfully, until very recently. So, yeah. So the main frame, the two open groups, then is the same. So this frame is the same. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, so, so in fact, I'm, I'm not even doing that. There could be regions, for example, which have many galaxies. There could be some, like, say, over here, or these, you don't know that. But no, in fact, you do know that. That is the point. You have to know that. You have to, somebody has to tell you beforehand that there are galaxies here. How? Huh, that's a very good question. That is the biggest issue. So, the, so the start is if I don't know. Then it's not the case. No, then you can't. No, then you can't do it. You can't do it because, see the reason that you get the signal is 
that the galaxies are all in the centers of these planes, right? If I don't know where they are, then they are not in the center, they can be anywhere. Then, why should I get a signal in the center? I can do this fast, I can go somewhere. So I blindly take in, let me say, just call me. Yeah, it won't help you. It won't help you for simple reasons. Then think about why, why are you getting that? So I know how to take it. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. So let's say, let's say that this plane, this call Earth, has a galaxy on the edge. Okay? Now that signal is going to be sitting over here. Right? When I add it, when I add this region to this region, they don't add up. This signal is not in the same place as this signal. So I will not benefit by the planet stacking. I have to stack only with the galaxies right in the center, which means I have to know where the galaxies are. Ha, that is the hard part. The way you know it is that your good friend, who is an optical astronomer, has to go out and with an optical telescope measure the position to those galaxies and it turns out their edges. Their, their you can see the blueprint of the thing. Exactly. And that's, that's the game. You have to have that information. If you didn't have that information, you could not start. Yeah. So JWST recently saw a galaxy which was shifted by 11 or 12. Yeah. There is no camera. So JWST recently saw a galaxy which was reshifted by 11 or 12. There is still some debate whether actually it is 12 or 12. Sure. So assuming that is the case, can the telescope that you are pointing out, GMRT, can they do the same thing over here for those galaxies also? If, if you have only, remember, you need to have a lot of galaxies. One galaxy is there. Are there going to be three if I am not sure? Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 so I will tell you where they are going in the future. But the, the short answer is no. Very, 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 very difficult. For those galaxies, and even, even they are very difficult, you will need to build a much bigger telescope. Can't you point the telescope at the same point in the sky? Okay. Like, you, you can point the telescope at the same point. Then I, need, the I need all those galaxies. You don't think you'll find, I mean, you'll find 20 galaxies, maybe 50 if you're lucky. But how much do you, what is the sample size that you'll need? You'll see in the future. What's the sample size that you'll see in the future? So I just showed you that this is a simulation. There's 400 galaxies over here. Yeah, okay. But does that mean the 400 galaxies is enough? Answer is no. I need much more power. And that has been the problem over the last 20 years. Getting enough galaxies such that we can do this and a telescope that can cover all those galaxies at the same time has been a challenge. So that's the deal. So what we've been doing now, the, all of this, we tried it for a while. We've been trying this for about a decade now. But what happened was that about five years ago, the telescope, you know, our baby, so to speak, was upgraded. You got better electronics. So again, the technological jump happened. You got better electronics, better sensitivity, and we could observe more galaxies at the same time. That made all the difference. So what we did was that we said, fine, if I'm going to take advantage of this new telescope, this upgraded telescope. And we decided to cover three different epochs in the history of the universe. So one epoch over here, which is about three and a half billion years ago. One epoch over here, which is about 8 to, eight to 10 billion years ago, 8 to 9 and a half billion years ago. And then one epoch over here in magenta, which is about 10 and a half to 11 and a half billion years ago. And the idea was that we can, using this, we can do the same, the same game that these people are playing, but now in gas. And so if we can do this, that would be fantastic. And of course, the region that we were really interested in was the yellow one over here. Because that's covering both this flat part of star formation activity and the decline. So we were hoping to be able to answer this question that why does this thing break up? Why does the decline happen? By taking galaxies in this part of the region and in this part of the region and asking, does something happen? Is there some difference between them? That was the hope. We didn't think it was likely that we'd get an answer. Because it seems like it's a small period, right? So it seems a bit too much to hope for that something spectacular happens in the universe in this narrow range and this can actually observe. So there were two PhD students, both excellent uh, students, Apur Kobera, who worked on these data, and Aditya Chaudhary, who's worked on both of these data sets. And they basically wrote the book, this time we are talking. So what did we see? What we saw was this. So this is an average gas portrait of these early galaxies. And this, remarkably, is from this yellow region. 
The number can standish together to get this is 11,000. 11,439. That's a lot. We had 16,000 to start with. And we had to, because some galaxies were affected by problems and so on. If we didn't have of the option, then when we started this, we had about 7,500. And we actually saw the signal with 7,500 about a couple of years ago. And then we went deeper because we wanted to do something that we suddenly realized that we might be able to do. We went deeper and we got about 11,500 over here. And this was the first measurement of the gas mass of galaxies from this EDA cosmos. Yes, no, no, so, so this plot is just overlaying the regions that we are observing. I think, yeah. yeah, the basic plot was that on which we Oh, optical, optical and near infrared. And in fact, the optical near infrared and a little bit of far infrared, mostly optical and near infrared. So, so these are the. Uh, the Let's take optical and infrared. There are technical issues over here with what you're observing, but optical and infrared is the bulk of the, of the data. Up, up to mid infrared. So the Spitzer telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Keck telescopes, the VLT, all contributed to this plot. Gemini also contributed. But Spitzer was really important, and Hubble Space Telescope was really important. You get, you get in that background plot. That's telling you what the stars are doing. And you can you can observe that in the optical and the near infrared. So this gives you No, no. This gives us only a big picture view of a galaxy that way. It's not letting us no. No, but the problem is that remember, I have a telescope, right? I'm gonna point to the sky. I have some region that I can cover in one shot. I need to have a lot of galaxies in that region. These observations are observing the your large areas of the sky. I don't benefit with that. So I need to have somebody kind enough to actually do a measurement of a lot of galaxies in a small region. And it turned out, just by sheer chance, a bunch of folk in the University of California, Santa Cruz, had actually used the Keck telescope to do precisely this. For a completely different reason, it turned out. Of course, for the same kind of reason. They were interested in this period. They were interested in stellar evolution in this period. So therefore, they used the optical telescope to find a bunch of galaxies in this period to probe the evolution. Exactly those galaxies we could use. And that made the difference. So that's what we got. So this was the first measurement of the atomic gas mass. And this kind of blew us away. The reason it blew us away was that if you look at today's universe, there's much less gas in galaxies than there are stars. There's about 10 times more mass in stars, say in the Milky Way, than in atomic gas. And so, if you like, stars dominate the mass of today's galaxies. This was exactly the opposite. It turns out, at this epoch in the universe, gas dominates. 75% of the mass of these galaxies is in the form of atomic hydrogen. It basically is the main constituent of galaxies at this epoch. And nobody knew this. So we were, we were stunned by this is what we're seeing. And it was because of that that we could do the next step. So of course a bunch of other things were done, but I'm just, I'm just going to show you one more figure, which I think is really cute, which is this. So this is now the same uh, galaxies, but all that's been done is that we've broken it up into two halves. We've taken a, we've drawn a line exactly at this point, and we've taken these galaxies and these galaxies. So these galaxies are from 8 billion years ago, and these are from 9, and these are on the same scale. This image is about three and a half times brighter than this one. So there is basically a spectacular change in the 21 centimeter signal of galaxies nine billion years ago and eight billion years ago. And remember, the 21 centimeter signal is proportional to the atomic gas mass. So what this is telling you is that the atomic gas mass of these galaxies is about three and a half to four times larger than these galaxies. And these galaxies have been chosen Again, the same time statistics to have the same properties. So these are the same properties in stellar mass, but yet these objects have about four times more gas than these objects. So there is this remarkable drop in the atomic gas mass of galaxies right here, right at the point of being stopped. And that we think is the cause of this steep decline. It was basically 
thing happening is that, look, if you go back to that picture that I showed you right at the beginning, the gas is flowing into a galaxy from the certain galactic medium. What we think is happening is that these galaxies, the big ones, which dominated the star formation activity of the universe, they contribute about 80% of the star formation in the universe. Those galaxies are eating up their gas in star formation really fast. Now, if they want to keep forming stars at the same rate, I need to now bring in gas from the from the sun galactic medium. If I don't bring gas in, there's no gas, there's no fuel left to form stars. Star formation stops or slows down. And that's what we think is happening. There's just not enough gas flowing into these galaxies to maintain this high star formation activity. And because of this, we can actually, for the first time now, directly determine the rate at which gas is accreting. So that the picture I showed you in the beginning of gas flowing on the galaxies, I can actually tell you now what the rate of accretion is from this epoch, this epoch, average rate of accretion. And that is something that hugely is constraining for the simulations. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're included. All oh, those blowouts are supernovae. No, so, so supernovae explosions will depend on the stuff of the So, so basically, supernovae happen in. Yeah, it would have to. It would have to. So, supernovae are basically uh, happen. They happen only the most. They, they happen only the most massive stars. If you want fewer of the most massive stars, you have fewer supernovae. Yeah. So, you said the rate of excretion of the gas into the galaxy. Can you determine what is that rate? Yeah. Has it remained the same? Has no. it changed? It's changed. It's dropped with time. It has to have dropped with time. Because if it had not dropped with time, and in fact, you know, that's what we will we want to do in the next step. That's what we are they're pushing to try to do a measurement here. We don't have a measurement as yet, but they're closely doing. So the hope is that we will actually be able to measure the gas mass of galaxies in this epoch also, which we have not finished, we're still working on those data. And then do a comparison from here to here to here. And then we can actually probe the accretion rate with time. Oh, the average accretion rate. Yeah. One more thing, the same thing. You said the cosmic mode, right? Yeah. Just go back to the previous one. Okay. So you, you are focusing more on the yellow part. Oh, we are focusing right now on the yellow part. Yellow part, yeah. Okay. What about the purple part? Oh, the magenta. magenta. Yeah. So, so the magenta part is something that we are taking data right now. So it turns as if, remember that's further away. So this is much further away, but more to the point, besides being further away, it turns out we don't have that many galaxies here. We only have about a thousand galaxies in this region. Because of which, even if they have higher masses, we need to observe for much more time to detect the signal. So we are doing a much deeper observation in this region. And it turns out next year, it's been slowed down because of the pandemic. Around next year, the Subaru telescope built in by the Japanese, also in Mauna Kea, will actually be releasing a whole bunch of galaxies in the same region that we are observing. So we expect about a year from now, with our current data, we will now know the locations of a large number of galaxies over here, in this, in this window. And then, we will be able to give you an answer to this question. So we already take the data, and they are processing their optical data over the next year or two. Once they release the data, we will simply pause and we get the answer to this question. But we think we get the answer even before the release, but, but that's the second issue. We will definitely get it a year and a half. Okay. So the part to magenta, yeah. where the star formation which is exponentially initiating, where it plateaued. Yeah. If we determine that reason why it plateaued, maybe that's, what, that's what we're hoping to do. So once we determine that reason, will that not help us to determine the why it started declining? No, so this has nothing to do with this. This is plateau, this is decline. We already know why it's declining. You know it's declined. You do not know the reason why it is declining. I'm telling you the reason it's declining. Okay. I'm telling you that the, this is the reason it's declining. Yeah, but why it happened at 80 million? Oh, happened at 80 million. No, so there are two questions. We do. I'll tell why it happened also. So the reason it happened is that, okay, so what's happening is that, again, you, you have to go back and look, take a look at the picture of the simulation. Right? So remember, in early times, there's lots of gas in a certain galaxy medium. Gas is flowing in. As time goes by, the gas in certain galaxy medium is being eaten up. Because it's going into the galaxy and going into stars. There's less gas out there. Now, what's happening is that at this epoch, the galaxies which dominate the star formation activity, so if you look at you know, what is causing this, uh, this activity, 
80%, 85% of it, is in the most massive galaxies. Those galaxies eat up their gas much faster than all the others. Yeah. So those galaxies are the ones which have actually consumed their gas about 50 years ago. Yeah, that is the reason why yes. we know that we actually ate 2.8.5. Oh, no, no. So, so I, I have that data, these data, and then a measurement of the gas. This is a direct measurement of the gas. So I'm telling you the gas mass of these galaxies. So this is an in situ measurement of the gas content. That's so it, this is what I direct the measure that you can describe. And then you explicitly, this is the gas mass at this time, this is the gas mass at this time, this is much bigger. Which means that how does this happen, right? There's gas falling into galaxies and there's gas being consumed by star formation. So the only way you can add gas in my emission. So, the inference is very straightforward. So, for all these measurements, the time zone, all the same uh, measurements, the same Exactly. Everyone around the world, sometimes it's the same thing. No, not everyone. It's, 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 a, it's a small region. See, these are, remember, these are in time. Yeah. Right? Time can be they, they're observing all over the sky. Yeah. They're observing over this small region. Yeah. But that region, why was it selected? Oh, because this region is very interesting. This time region. Not the for the same thing I told you a little while ago. No, no, no. It's the philosophy of the 90s. It's a big field. So you choose regions of the sky such that you go to observe those regions with every telescope that you have. So therefore, that's the point. Oh, because it's clean. So, so the, way, the way you choose it is that. So like, you're the Milky Way. The Milky Way is this galaxy. Now, if you choose a region which is in the plane, the Milky Way, you, you want to go away. So you choose regions such that there are no bright stars nearby. You choose regions such, for example, like this region, the magenta region that you're observing, is chosen so that it's near the equator, which means that the telescopes in the north and the south can see it. But those are reasons why they chose the region. So there are about half a dozen such fields in the sky, uh, which can be observed. And you, you target those fields because those are the fields that everybody has information. So for all your data, No, no, you don't. No, you don't. In fact, in fact, you won't, it turns out. Up to a point. So it turns out that we have data, there's one region which is special, which is called the Cosmos region, which is like a region on the equator. We are observing that particular region with at this at this time, at this time, and this time. Right? And that just it turns out that it's done for interesting reasons. But our main result, the result that I'm showing you here is not from that region. It's from seven different regions observed by somebody else because it turned out we have better data. Those data were better suited for our measurements than the cosmos data. Correlate everything in space. You do, you, you're not correlating in space. No. No, no, wait, 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 wait. You're not correlating in space. Should we think, think of that? Look, it was not looking at it's not the same galaxy going forward. That's the issue. So I don't care if the galaxy is here in which it was at 10 million years ago or here. It doesn't make a difference to me. The point is that I, it should be, there should be enough such galaxies such that I can observe them with my legal telescope. Whether they are here or here is a side issue. If they are here, fantastic. So much the better. It turns out that for cosmos, which is kind of the good field to observe, unfortunately, this look back time is not as good in terms of galaxies as the other regions that we chose. So we chose to observe those first, and only now are we saying, okay, you know, we could also do cosmos. Why not? You know, we, we can do it. So it, it's worth doing. Yeah, I think he had a question for a Yeah, so just when you're staying at this club, I was naively thinking whether the drop in your uh, galaxy formations could be due to expanding universe, and that's why your average mass density is decreasing. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. No, no, mass. It has nothing to do with expanding universe. First of all, it's not a drop in galaxy formation. It's a drop in star formation. It's star formation within galaxies. Right? So, so this is the galaxies have formed much earlier, typically. It's the stars within the galaxies which are being produced or, or, or not being produced with time. So it's not galaxy formation.
So two questions. Yeah, one, what you just said earlier that you could observe in one place or the other, and the reason that the cosmic, uh, what was it, cosmos, cosmos was not chosen was it was not in the good viewing. No, it, it's not part of the good viewing. The galaxy samples, no, we need optical galaxy samples. The optical galaxy samples didn't have as nice properties. And as I said, we only had 3,000 galaxies in the region that we saw. Cosmos has more than 7,000. Okay, so it has nothing to do with the way the telescope or the telescope no. is placed. No, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's very easy for us to observe it. Okay. It's just that they had found a large number of galaxies in the other region. So we said, oh, wonderful, we want more galaxies to chase our planet. Okay. We are doing cosmos now. But it will be done less efficiently. So, okay. yeah, it's, it's one of those funny things that the, the, the thing that lets us detect the human sending signals, you require galaxies of a certain quality. You need to measure their positions and Look back times with enough accuracy. And Cosmos doesn't have that accuracy. While the other region actually had that accuracy. Okay. Because we should be able to Second question was that you just said. He's right, the universe is expanding, right? So 12 billion years, the universe was much more compact compared to what it is right now. Yeah. So is it the high noon when the high noon started also or where the decline started? Is it that because of the expansion of the universe? Because the as a universe expands, as a space time expands, the amount of gas which is there, the density of the gas increases. No, that. So it turns out the galaxies are forming very efficiently over here. No, efficiency is one thing, but the density. No, 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 the galaxy formation rate. Okay. See, the expansion of the universe doesn't affect stars. Stars are forming inside the galaxy. The expansion has nothing to see with the galaxy is gravitationally bound. Okay, but the galaxy is gravitationally bound, so it can, as long as the uh, space time universe is compact. It will have more gas to pull in. The moment so the circular equilibrium of the galaxy is also gravitationally bound. But the point is this: the, the, the simple thing to answer the question is that if I do the same clock, but instead of doing star formation activity, I do galaxy formation activity. Like, that keeps going up. The, the galaxy we form today. I mean, so mergers of galaxies, the way in which galaxies form, is via mergers. Yeah, it's kind of steadily going up. So in fact, in fact, over this world, yeah, in, in a slowish way, but yeah, it's rising over here. There are a lot of galaxies being formed over here. It turns out, in the current cosmological model, galaxies tend to form by mergers at late times. So you have lots of galaxies being formed today, in, in the recent past, but not so much at these times. So basically, galaxies form, big galaxies form by merging of small galaxies. Yeah, steadily, steadily moving up right now. In the future, so it turns out that we have, you know, the universe is dominated by dark energy, right now. And as of say about uh, roughly from this time uh, onwards, the universe is mainly dark energy. It turns out that has an effect, but we are still not seeing that effect. In the future, it will have an effect on the, on, on the galaxy formation, but right now it's still not, it's still not seen. So certainly up to about here, there's no problem with galaxy formation. Star formation, there is a problem. And is it possible that there are some samples in this? Especially in a high moon and before high moon, those stars were not a part of any galaxy. They were no, very hard, very hard. Yeah. very very hard because you need to have like enough gravitational attraction for a star to actually form. You need to have a lot of gas. Very difficult to have a star just form in situ in the intergalactic medium because the, the gas is not dense enough. The only place that, where the gas can be dense enough to form stars is the moment of emission. If you have a, if you have a gas cloud which forms stars, that's a galaxy by definition. So you need to have enough gas, and then you can form stars. If the star formation is going down, then um, well, then why is the galaxy formation going up? Why aren't galaxies composed of stars? That's a very good question. So they form galaxies and stars form for different reasons. So galaxies can form because of if I take two galaxies which are small and I merge them together, they form a bigger galaxy. But the star formation may not go up in those galaxies. It might it might go up a little bit, but it won't go up as much as I formed a much bigger galaxy by mixing two galaxies together. And it turns out in the, in, the, in, the, in the cosmological model that we have today, this merging is extremely important. So therefore, you tend to form new galaxies by mixing galaxies together, but the galaxies themselves are not forming stars as much as they were in the past. And that probably is because both of those galaxies have eaten up the gas around them. And there's not much, much gas left over. So you form a little bit of stars for a little time, and boom, it goes down again. Okay. Could 
the galaxies potentially form together when we take a like a huge single galaxy. Because um, you are saying that since galaxy formation is going up because of merging, so could they form together to make a huge galaxy? You could. So in fact, we think that the biggest galaxies in the observatory actually formed from gigantic mergers billions of years ago. So there's a little epoch over here with the biggest galaxies. Most massive galaxies form and they then merge with each other and they then boom, they produce a lot of stars and then they start to form stars completely. So they kind of, there's this period over here where a small group of really big galaxies were formed. Right? Today, we're not really producing these gigantic galaxies, we're merging smaller galaxies and producing medium sized galaxies and so on as we go along. The biggest galaxies actually have already formed star form stars. So the Milky Way is not a huge galaxy. It's a big star forming galaxy, but there are lots of galaxies much bigger than the Milky Way in terms of total mass. So it's a good question. Uh, and the answer is probably that we will not be producing super duper galaxies in the future. So why is there a gate to stop the planet galaxy? Ah, okay, that's a good very good question. That we kind of understand. The answer is that because it is my hand there. The reason that happens is that so what do you need to form stars, right? But you need the galaxy to be something more. So there's two things that you need. The gas and the galaxy is something more, turns out. What you need it is cooling. So I said that gas is flowing into the galaxy, the gas is cooled. So how does gas cool in the galaxy? It turns out that gas cools via what are called metals, things like iron and carbon and oxygen, and these are not called metals on planet Earth. Everything, every atom, which is a higher than atomic number than helium. Everything besides hydrogen and helium in astronomy is called a metal. Astronomers are not. No, no. But basically, all of these atoms carbon, oxygen, ion, silicon, zinc all of these are needed to actually cool the gas. The way they cool the gas is that they radiate. So they, they basically, so you know, the, the, the gas, we think about temperature. What is temperature? If I, take, if I take a gas and say this temperature is some number, and the other gas has a slightly higher temperature. What that means is that these particles in this gas are moving faster and these are moving slower, right? So that means that these particles have slightly more kinetic energy, right? Now let's say that I have a particle which has a high kinetic energy and it comes and whacks into another particle, right? Now what can happen when you have an atom is that this energy can be transferred to this other atom, either in the form of kinetic energy or in the form of what is called excitation. That's a quantum mechanical effect. You can basically shift the particle to an upward excited state. Right? So now this has gone to an upward excited state. Its kinetic energy has not gone up that much. The energy has gone into this excitation. So it's, a, it's an excited particle. Now how does the particle get de-excited? It gets de-excited by radiating. So it radiates electromagnetic radiation. Right? That radiation comes out and that radiation simply comes out of this gas cloud. Which means that by this excitation and radiation, you have lost energy. Because the electromagnetic radiation is carrying energy out of the gas. But if you didn't have atoms that could do this excitation and de excitation, you wouldn't lose this radiation. The gas won't cool. The best atoms for cooling, it turns out, are oxygen and carbon. Carbon is the most important one. There are lots of work that they're doing. On galaxies that these mentions are based on the most important moving line in the, in the universe is a carbon line in the bottom of it. That's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely important line because that line is the thing through which all galaxies cool. So you need cooling, right? Which means that how do I so I need to have a lot of metals, I need to have lots of carbon, lots of oxygen, let's say. How do I form carbon and oxygen in the universe? I form carbon and oxygen from stars. So let's say I start in a galaxy which didn't have too many stars. The stars have to go supernovae to produce carbon and oxygen in the interstellar medium. But there are not that many stars. So there's not that many metals. That's not, there's not that much of cooling. Because which there's not that much star formation. Now you form some stars, they go supernovae, they throw metals into the interstellar medium. That increases the cooling. That increases the formation of stars. That increases the throwing out of metals. That increases the formation of stars. 
And this is like a feedback process. It keeps increasing and goes faster and faster and faster. And so you just ask it and it keeps going up. But this part, we kind of understand on physical terms. When metals are just going up, and we can actually observe the metricity of galaxies in this region and find that, yeah, it's going up still. But the weird thing over here is that the metricity still keeps going up, but the starvation does not. So something else is now causing it to plan. So that's why it's different. This part, it is interesting, but we think you understand. These two parts are things. So we are studying that part now. We are studying, yeah, this part we think we understand now, although lots of work still to be done. I mean, there are other complications which we should worry about, but we think we have a big picture view of the problem. That we understand the physics, the main physical cause for this curve to around. We still don't understand the physical cause for this planet. That's why you want to go and chase up in this region. And then, of course, we come to also detect galaxies over here. We like to characterize galaxies, if you like, in portraits of galaxies all the way until early on, which is very tough. So that's where we are today. We finally have visual in this Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So she says that you said that the metallicity of the stars is actually increasing. Let's see the galaxy. And the metallicity of galaxies is increasing at that time. So, can that be a reason why the star formation then plateaued? After no, from no, not really. So, uh, so, so suppose, for example, the density is being constant also. Mm -hmm. Then the cooling will be constant. But the density is going up. So the cooling is going up. But since the density is going up, the consumption of hydrogen is happening from 13 billion to almost 11 billion. Yeah. That would have led to a decrease in the hydrogen fuel that is required. So, so, no, but that's the second order of things. The question is, uh -huh. so, so clearly there is some kind of feedback effect going on. So okay. the details of the feedback are the issue. So, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Okay. so the question is now, is it that something causes the hydrogen to grow and stay constant? It's not going up. So there's some mechanism in play over here which is causing a balance. We don't know the answer is that. So that's what I'd like you to take away from this. We basically think we know the answer to this question. Why does the stop mission activity in the universe decline finally uh, from about 8 billion years ago? And we know we think we know this because of this. We have estimates now of the atomic gas mass in the large number of galaxies, and it's clear that at least out to here, the atomic gas mass is the main constituent of the mass of galaxies, of, of the baryonic mass of galaxies. And so clearly it's a thing that we really should be chasing after to understand what's going on in it. So I'll leave you with this then. The stuff I'd like you to take away from this talk are that if you want to understand galaxy evolution, you must understand what is done with the gas. The picture that we've been forming of the universe has been predominantly based on stars, almost exclusively based on stars. We are now at a point where, for the first time, we can actually probe the evolution of the fuel for star formation. And for that, we need these studies, and we need you know, powerful telescopes like the GMR. The big question over the last 20 25 years in the field has been why does star formation activity in the universe drop over the last eight or so million years? And for that, we needed to pick very much every single the measure the atomic gas contained in these galaxies, and that's been tough. We've been trying this for a while, and it's been, it has been worked. Stacking lets us get around the weakness of the line by averaging the signals from lots of galaxies. The upside is that this lets us get around this problem. The downside is that we get the average gas properties. But fortunately, to answer this question, that's what we want. We want the average gas properties of a large number of galaxies. And the GMOT is a wonderful instrument for this. We upgraded GMOT. It's actually just worked perfect for this. You can see lots of galaxies at the same time, and so therefore, in a single observation, you cover a large number of objects, which means that your efficiency in terms of doing this packing is very high compared to other telescopes. So with the GMRT now, we have the first detection of this 21 centimeter signal, the average signal, and cosmic tone, and we see this remarkable sharp drop in the gas mass in the galaxies between 9 and 8 billion years ago. And what this is telling us is that there's just not enough gas to maintain star formation in these biggest galaxies. And we also found that it's the biggest galaxies that show this drop, not the smaller ones. So what's next? What's next, of course, is that we're doing a detailed characterization of the gas properties of these galaxies up to one and a half million years ago, with that yellow region that I talked about. We are also, of course, doing a characterization of the properties about four billion years ago. And we're pushing now to an even more exciting epoch, this uh, the magenta region, about out to about 11 and a half million years ago, we hope we will answer the next question, which is why do things flatten out over the next couple of years? We think we can. And then what we really want to do, 
and this is something which we are putting in a proposal for right now to get funding, is to expand the GMRT. The GMRT has is this is a gigantic system, but open. It's, it's the most sensitive telescope in the world for this kind of work. But over the next decade or so, the square kilometer array in phase one is probably going to be built in South Africa. At this point, the GMRT will not be competitive with it. It turns out that by expanding the GMRT again intelligently, you can compete. You can actually increase the region of the sky that you can observe at one point in time by building these new uh, receiver systems, which are called focal plane arrays, where with the same dishes, I can observe a much larger region, 20 times larger, at one shot. And so the current plan is that we'll double the number of antennas, we'll go to about 60 antennas, that's the, the idea, and then we'll install these focal plane arrays on these antennas, so we'll get an increase in sensitivity by a factor of 2, but we'll get an increase in the field of view in the sky by a factor of 30. And that we think will allow us to detect these 21 centimeter signals from individual galaxies at this level. At which point, then we can take the next step, which is actually looking at the details of individual galaxies. I give you a portrait, what I would call an average portrait of galaxies 9 and 8 billion years ago. We will, we think, a decade from now, five years from now, be able to actually show you individual objects and compare the properties of individual objects, the stellar, uh, metal, and so on. That's the hope over the next three years. Thank you. Um, so, I, so you were mentioning our digital gateways, right? So what I wanted to ask, are there um, favorites in the wavelengths, as in like, you have X-ray and then you have Yeah, so you have stage and then the optical and the like Yes. Yeah. Is it like a wave a wavelength between them? Yes. So, so you have... use that in the um... Yeah. So for example, I mean this is showing the four the four regions that we use to probe these four types of gas. In the reality, the, the shortest wavelength is called gamma rays, which are not shown on the earth. X-rays is the range. Between X-rays and optical is ultraviolet, you know. They are lucky because the sun emits a lot of ultraviolet, and the other atmosphere which stops the ultraviolet radiation and that stops us from getting cancer. Then there's optical. Then beyond the optical, there is the infrared. The infrared is made up of near infrared, mid infrared, and far infrared. Far infrared shifts to the millimeter. Then there is the, the whatever centimeter. Then there is a the meter. And you are part of the radio. But basically, wavelengths are continuous. So there is a 21 centimeter and 21.1 centimeter. 21.1 I have a question. Yeah. So when we uh, make these 21 centimeter observations, do we have to account for the very same gas in our own galaxy that we look through? That's a, that's a good question. The answer is no. The short answer is no. I'll show you mine. Maybe I can show you mine. I'm taking mine. <laughs> yes. Please stop. So this is a different view of the same thing. It shows the gas needed as well. It shows the big picture, you know, it's filaments. But I thought that would be too confusing, so I just get rid of that now. Which I thought. Okay, so let me answer the question um, you know, before the recap. So this is just brief. So, uh, so 21 centimeter is a spectral line. It's a line that happens because in the ground state of the hydrogen, it's a, it's a quantum mechanical effect. In the ground state of the hydrogen atom, there are these two energy levels. So the hydrogen atom contains a proton and an electron. Now, in quantum mechanics, particles can have what's called a spin, which is a purely quantum mechanical effect. Now, in the ground state of the hydrogen atom, there are two possible orientations of the electron spin relative to proton spin. So one the spin is a matter, and the other spin is antimatter. It turns out that these two states are different energies. The magnetic interaction is different between the two states. So the antimagnetic state is a lower energy. The 21 centimeter line is a transition from one state to the other, and that comes at a wavelength of 21.11 centimeters 
Now the frequency of 14, 15, 44, 0, 5, 7, 5 microns, right? The frequency is important. Now, what happens for a galaxy 10 billion years ago? Some of you may have noticed that I've been, I keep using a word which I have told myself I should not use. It's not abuse, it's not bad language. It's the word redshift. Redshift is a word I'm trying not to use, to use because it's a technical word. It's used very commonly, but it's a technical word. The redshift arises because the universe is expanding. So the redshift is simply the stretching of lengths, right? The redshift is just literally, it, 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 it's, it's defined as the length by which, the factor by which the length is stretched. What does this mean? Think of a wavelength. A wavelength is stretched by the same redshift. Which means that 21.11 centimeters is the wavelength of the signal for our galaxy. For a galaxy which has a redshift of 1, so 8 billion years ago is a redshift of 1. For a galaxy a redshift of 1, the wavelength is 21.11 multiplied by 1 plus n, which is 1 plus 1, which is 2. So it's 42 centimeters. Which means that I can observe at a wavelength of 42 centimeters to see galaxies at the redshift of 1. And at 50 centimeters to see galaxies at the redshift of 1.2. They're all at different wavelengths. And so that separates out. So in fact, this. How do they do this? Um, that, that picture that you saw of star formation activity versus time. I actually, uh, if I ask Aditya, who is a super uh, plotter in more ways than one, normally that picture is plotted. As a function of redshift. But because redshift is technical, I didn't want to get into the definition of cosmological redshift, time is sufficient. If you plot the same picture, I'm going to show it to you once the theory movie finishes, and show you the same picture in terms of redshift, and it looks very different. It, it has the same patterns, but in terms of the mapping from redshift to time, is not linear. And you'll see that in a second. But you actually. In fact, when I see this, this picture, it looks weird to me because I'm used to seeing the picture in terms of redshift. And this one is, is a strange picture and it doesn't kind of make the point which we always make. In terms of cosmology, redshift is what matters. So, uh, while making observations by every band, it's electric galaxy and Exactly. So, you have to observe, uh, if, you, if you want to observe a galaxy, let's say in a 21 centimeter, you must observe it at 21 centimeter multiplied by 1 plus 6 redshift. If that is the issue, you know, I was kind of alluding to this, but not saying it. The, the reason that we need to get those good, the, you know, the good measurements, cosmos is poor at shift accuracy. Well, D2, the, 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 the fields that we looked at, has, has much, much, much better at shift So we chose. So a redshift is basically so. You know, the, the accuracy, how well do I know the redshift? Is the redshift 1 or 1.001 or 1.001? 1 Exactly that accuracy matters. The reason it matters is that when I'm averaging these lines, I'm aligning, and I kind of show that but didn't tell you about it. I will show you the slices, right? Those slices are actually wavelength slices. So now when I say that a galaxy is in this slice, that means that 21.11 multiplied by 1 plus in redshift is in that slice. What if I redshift as an error? Now I don't know is it in this slice or in this slice. Why should there be an error? Oh, who's it to measure? Oh, so, okay, so. Why that, that for this galaxy I have an error? For this I have a better accuracy. Yeah. So, it has to do with two things. The way, the so the, the, the accuracy depends on the sensitivity of your observations. How sensitive are your measurements? That's all. So, it turns out that the D2 survey, they were really interested in very accurate measurements. So, they did very detailed and deep observations to get those measurements. For Cosmos, they didn't care that much about the redshift. Yeah. One is a redshift of 2. Here, another one is a redshift of 2. Yeah. I should not say anything. No, you might. If you have the same set of instruments. But the question is how much time. So if you observe this one at 2 and this one at 2, did you observe the same settings? That's one. Second, did you observe the same amount of time? Right. How much time did you observe? If you observe the same, for the same time, yeah, then it's fine. Then there's no problem. So the, the reason that D2 is much better is yeah, that they spend a lot of time. Yeah. You want to show us the graph? Ah yes, okay. Uh, remind me not to go backwards and see the silly movie again. Yeah. So yeah, so this is the this is the graph in redshift. 
the Lupin type is now on the plot axis. This is what we normally plot in papers. And you can see it's almost symmetric. It rises from a direction to about 8, then we have measurements. It goes up to a direction to about 3, 3 and a half or so. And then it declines to a direction to about 1. So this region is about 1 to 3. This is P1 plus 15. This entire region is 8 billion years. This region is 2 billion years. And this region is about 1, 1 and a half billion years. So the mapping from redshift to time is not linear. And that's why I was trying to avoid, I, I, I tried very hard to not use the word redshift, but I can't you know, explain why wavelengths are different without giving redshift data, unfortunately. But which is nice, it's not a bad thing to talk about. It. So this is the, so normally when I give this term, I would say this translation activity increases redshift from 8 to 3. I don't say 12.5 billion years to 11.5 billion years. I say 8 to 3. And similarly, this is called the epoch galaxy essentially, or cosmic moon. And then this is this decline that we are talking about. No, Russian time is the same thing. There's no difference. I mean, the physics has to break the crisis of the crossing matter. Huh? Have you been another JMRT somewhere in Eastern India or Southern India? This is so interesting. Well, so that's a good question. It's an interesting point. In fact, there are, there are very good reasons to not build the JMRT residence. So the GMRT was built, I mean, I'm old enough some sadly to have seen the, uh, the early GMRT. You can't leave out the GMRT in the 90s to have seen the Paris PhD student. And in those days, the GMRT, I mean, India was a fantastic place for radio astronomy. Because the big problem with radio astronomy is that they are humans. And humans actually, you know, have cell phones and TVs and all kinds of electronic gadgets. All of these signals, all of these electronic pieces radiate. And we are looking for this really faint signal at radio wavelengths with this huge amount of radiation all around us. Now, in India, in, up to the 90s, we didn't have that much of electronics. And so, when I was a student, the GMRT was a really clean piece. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, the GMRT is in a very fertile location. It's fertile because in the 90s, people built canals to connect the rivers around the place. And so, there's lots of great irrigation over there. As a result of which, the farmers are very rich. They become really rich from the late 90s onwards. As a result of which, you have a huge increase in the amount of electromagnetic radiation. There are lots of industries not far away, and there's lots of heavy agriculture. And now they're building a, a, a train line which is killing us. So we struggle like mad to try to reduce the amount of radiation. That's a huge issue to keep the, the sky quiet, if you like. And so that is the reason to shift to a different place. Because that area is full of stuff. It's much better than the US. But for example, if you build something in Ladakh, say, mm -hmm. that's the target. The next question was going to go Ladakh, Arunachal. Yeah. But, also, but the problem is that, so now, suppose we go to a new place. Or Andamans also. Andamans also will be very. Yeah. And Andamans have, have advantages and disadvantages. So the thing that you have to worry about for building a big telescope like the GMRT is access. You need to have a lot of people over there. You need to set up, I mean, they're talking about huge data volumes. So each observer, like if I observe for 10 hours in a day, right, I use about one terabyte of data. That's a massive amount of data. Which means that I need to have good optical fiber connection, I need to have a lot of backup structures which will keep my telescope functioning. I need to have really good electricity. If the electricity fails in that area, I'm in big trouble. So then all I have to completely set up a generator which just works perfectly. That's an issue. So I think you won't be near backup generators. Which, if the power fails for more than, uh, it will keep the principle running for about a day, day and a half. But that's because we know that in Maharashtra or there in Pune, it won't fail for, for that long. If I in the 90s, it sometimes did fail though. But now it doesn't. So now if I go to a place which doesn't have this kind of infrastructure, you have all the other problems. So there are pros and cons. And the, it, it's a cost benefit ratio, so to speak. The amount of money you would spend building a new telescope. Completely new place will be huge compared to building the same telescope at the same place where you have your infrastructure over there. So that is the reason to do it over there. On the other hand, the problems are also higher over there. In fact, you know all of this stuff is hurting us right now. Right? We would we would have done much better if we had the receivers available ten years ago. And ten years from now, it will be worse. The, the, the difference will be worse and worse with time. Cell phones are just bothering us right now. Uh, 
Aren't you filters which can actually filter? They are filters. So, they are. so it's two things. One is that you need uh, you can do filters. The problem is that there are two kinds of, of interference. There's very strong interference. So we call this radio frequency interference. It's, it's the radio strong one, three letter word if you like. So you can you, there are two kinds of filters. There are two kinds of interference. One is really strong stuff, right? Now this stuff you can filter out fairly easily. The problem is not the strong stuff. The problem is a very weak stuff, which is at the level of your signal. That stuff is very hard to filter out. Because you filter that out, how are you going to filter out you know, the, the, this, this stuff or your signal? So that's the part which is deadly. So it's this range of types of interference, very strong to weak. We right now are in, 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 the, in that particular wavelength range. We're actually doing okay. We're not in these places, you know, in, certainly in developed countries, we are not in these places. It is a good place for this. But, like say, pipe chain is going to be hitting us. Pipe chain transmissions are at approximately these frequencies. One of the bands is right there. We have actually restricted ourselves, our band, to 850 megahertz because of 3G and 4G transmissions. So, the CDMA transmissions of the like, GEO, for example, are actually at 850 megahertz. So, we have designed our receivers to cut off those signals because if we let them come into our coverage, we will die. It completely saturated our electronics. So you have to play these games. You fil you're filtering effectively, but you're filtering down frequency. If you let, for example, there is powerful TV signal at 530 megahertz. Terrifying signal. It's the strongest signal that is around the G mod. You have to cut off our line at 530. If you let that signal come inside, we're doomed. And then what we do is that we negotiate with the cell phone uh, providers. So one of the things we've done is that, so we have you know, full time modified group which does this kind of stuff. We negotiate with the cell phone people to ask them to move their towers away from the telescope. So we've done this now, we, with, there are no towers within about 30 kilometers of the telescope. And because the further you are, the less the effect of interference we gain. So of course, all the people around that area don't like us at all, because the coverage is not so good, but you know, so if you find my dead body lying somewhere, you probably want the people who didn't get good coverage in this thing. But that's what you have to do. You have to work with people around you. and uh, try to uh, coexist, and then you do filtering, you do smart techniques to remove stuff. Things are getting worse. Twenty years ago, things were much better than they are, but it's still doing stuff. It's still up. The same reason that remember that now. So it's, it's, oh, it's hugely expensive. I mean, remember the, the amount of power they're consuming for this is massive. Yeah, yeah, but now you have yeah, but you have a power station there for yourself. That is very expensive. How much is cost of a telescope? How much is it? It's kilowatt or megawatt? Sorry? Is it kilowatts or many tens of megawatts? Many, many tens of megawatts. So I'll give you I'll give you an example. That's another I remember off my my head. For the spec kilometer array, the next generation telescope, which we are trying to compete with, right? The power consumption, the estimates of the power consumption for one nuclear power station. Just for that telescope. So you talk about 70 megawatts. What are you a thousand megawatt. Sorry? That's not a spec one either, right? For us, it's, it's much lower right now. But it's in the many tens of megawatts. So the, the power consumption is a huge issue. And cost, so basically what you're doing when you're playing these games or where to put it, you're playing all these balance games. How many antennas is an issue? And you cannot put solar panel cells all around there. So solar panels right now, so that's the 20 years ago, we were talking about spec one day. The hope was solar panels. But solar panels are not free. They have a cost. So now you have to include that cost per solar panel, include the cost of replacing the solar panels every so often, and ask how many solar panels do I need and factor that into your cost. All of this has to be built in into your cost estimates. So you can obviously solar panels, but they come with a cost. And solar panels right now are more efficient than they were 10 years ago. But unfortunately, not enough research has happened over the last 10 years on solar panels. We were hoping it would be better right now. Yeah, solar panels are the way forward. And you, you, you put telescopes in places like Australia, the Pacific or India, in non cloudy places. Rajasthan is also a place yeah, where there are, yeah, are there. Yeah. But again, same problem. Now we have to worry. So there are all these costs. All of these need to be put inside. So one cost is power, one cost is infrastructure, one cost is setting up the institution over there, one cost is optical bandwidth. That's just a cost by itself. It's a huge cost. So that's a dead end, that's a dead cost, right? Once you put it there, you don't need it. It's a large dead cost. So basically, you have to count all these costs. You can't just say that, oh, that's a dead cost. Because
Because that is the large difference. It's a lot of money you have to put right at the start. If that dominates your cost for the next 10 years, you are in big trouble. So all of this, this balance is what you have to worry about. And some of the stuff you can get back in software. So for example, RFI, you can do RFI mitigation, you can do filtering. So you can spend money over there. It's a difficult decision. It's not, it's not something which you can just say, oh, you know, let's do it. But definitely going to a completely new place has huge costs. And that's hard. And it may be the right way to do it. Yeah, science is very expensive, but it's that experiment that's totally worth it, and I'm so glad that you were here to tell us about it. Thank you. I, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Kanika. We hope that you could uh, wish that you could just continue to do what you do and write a book about what you do, and so you must please. Thanks for keeping it real for all of us who are not totally uh, at your level, or keeping it at the lay level. And I love the fact that we had this discussion at the Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium. Thank you so much for being a good host here. The quality of discussions really would not be the same anywhere else. We're hoping that our city uh, develops a culture where more such talks happen and more such discussions happen with a large number of people. And uh, Neetra and I don't know if you have any things to say next to you. Thank you. Neetra Adrid and the gentleman here. And I just love the difficulty of conversation that is happening, right, with everyone. So uh, it was great to have this quality of discussion. Thank you for coming in and doing this. Pleasure.